I'm so excited to talk to you today. Um, as you know, we've been reading The Shadow King for yes. our book club pick for Goop this month. Um, and we had a great discussion with some book club members yesterday. Um, and some people have dropped questions into our Facebook group. So I want to ask you some of their questions. And I have great. some of my own. Um, but we we all love this book. And I think it was interesting. It's always fun when people have strong reactions to characters <laughs> and to plot into writing it just makes it so much more enjoyable to to talk about and so thank you for that I I really appreciate it um so I think this is something we talked about before but I promised our readers that I would let you say it in your own words can you talk Mm -hmm. a little bit about how this story came came to you what the backstory is what your inspiration was and a little bit about your family history because I think it's, it's so fascinating Yeah, absolutely. Um, And first, thank you so much for reading and thank you for all the readers and the questions. Um, You know, I grew up with this story of Ethiopia defeating Italy and not only the the first time they came in in the late 1890s, but the second time they came in determined to to really win. Uh, You know, the the stories I, I was told by my family and by neighbors, everyone would talk about it was that here was a poorly equipped military or army. Um, that rose up against a highly weaponized European force and won. And the stories that my mother would tell, and I remember distinctly one moment at the dinner table when she said, you know, the Ethiopians, the men would keep charging at rifles until the rifles got so hot that they couldn't shoot anymore. And then Ethiopians just kept charging. And that image stuck in my head of people just willing to to fall so that the people behind them could could move ahead and how much do you have to charge you know to shoot for the gun to get too hot in your hand so I had those images and that was the book I was going to write um I had no idea about women that were involved I my sense of it was that they were there during the doing the traditional caretaking roles and uh, with research, I started stumbling on, you know, somebody in a letter saying there was a woman. And I said, wait a minute, where was the woman? You know? <laughs> and then seeing photographs of women in uniform. That completely changed everything. But it was not until I was basically almost literally done with the book and I was in the final edits that I decided I needed to make one last trip to Ethiopia to look at some of the battle sites. I held off on submitting the publication, the manuscript to my publisher, flew to Ethiopia, did a, I think a 10 day road trip with my mother and my cousin who's a tour guide, looked at all the sites, we talked about the book and it wasn't until I got home just before I had to fly back that my mother very casually said, well, you know, your great grandmother fought, your great grandmother fought in the war, or she enlisted in the war. And I couldn't believe that in all the years I'd worked on this, that I had someone in my family, a woman, that was part of this movement. And I, I had no sense of it. Um, and I asked my mother later, why didn't you tell me this? <laughs> she, Mom! <laughs> she, said, what? she said, well, you never asked. Like, oh my, how would I know? But I think the fact that it didn't even register that I might consider looking in my own family for this is really proof of how hidden this history is or how we just don't assume women um, women can be fighters also. And I think that was something we talked about yesterday too, this idea that the book was a way and a rude way of of memorializing, of recognizing, of preserving, of telling the story, of saying that these women were here, that they matter, that this is what they did. And once you had that seed, did you just start uncovering other stories of women? And how did it sort of unravel or build from Mm. there for you? Yeah, because, you know, what happens is once I found out that there was an entire legion of women who enlisted, and then I found some of their names 
then that begins the search of, okay, let me start looking. Do their names show up anywhere else? And then from there, I get location. And from location, I would start looking at battles. And that's where they started coming up. And in fact, there was, um, there's a report from New York Times, November, 1935, that talks about a woman who picks up the rifle of her fallen husband and leads his men in uh, continuing to lead his men into battle. And when I read that, there were two thoughts in my head. Number one, a woman led an army of men. And number two, she had to be fighting already because she needed to just take his rifle and continue on with that battle. And I kept finding things like that, but somehow, even if they've been in a newspaper, they don't get discussed, so they, they, get, they get erased in that way. Perhaps maybe a tie into that. Another thing we talked about a lot yesterday was the idea of shadows. And mm. someone brought this up and I was like, oh, I, I didn't think about that at first, but then I actually had a PDF of the book. So I went back through and I searched and I think shadow, the word comes up maybe 60 or 70 times in the book. And there's shadow in terms of physical shadow. So the shadow cast by a mountain, um, there's often, I notice like the shadows I'm, I have in my own dark shadows of eyes, there's the shadows <laughs> of photography, um, the shadows of ghosts and memories, shadow worlds. Um, and then this idea that I don't know if it was something that you thought about, but it kind of came up as we were talking about the book, but that each of us and the characters had these shadow selves. And I think for me, there was, this felt particularly true with, is after, is that mm -hmm, how you pronounce mm -hmm. it? Um, with after so there are moments where um, there's a moment later in the book I think when her root says she saw the she saw this this one part of after being represented in this moment when she was reprimanding another woman um, and I'm just wondering one how did you think about shadow going into the book was that something you wanted to play with and then the other, if you could talk a little bit about the Shadow King and, and who you thought was the Shadow King, because obviously in the literal sense, it was Minin who was dressed up and played and in some ways, you know, pretended to be this king. But in yeah. another sense, it was this collective. It, it was all of these women and, mm. and men, too, who, who served as the Shadow King. So if you yeah. could speak a little bit to that. Yeah, that's really, and you know, I have not looked up how many times Shadow <laughs> is in the book it's beautifully done <laughs> I didn't notice it until someone pointed it out that's great well it's it's interesting because that was a clear motif in the in the book when when I was starting this story I was thinking about um I was thinking about the the emperor in Ethiopia is said to be a, a son unto his people and when the emperor leaves the people are literally in a shot in shadows then and there's a there's a verse in the Bible that talks uh, that it's something like woe to the country that is shadowing Ethiopia with wings, and I I read that pretty early on in the in the writing, and for me it just felt like a metaphor for Rome coming in, you know, flying, and you can see you imagine the shadow of the planes, the their wings stretched out over the land. And I wanted to use that. And the more I got interested in thinking about photography as history, photography as a narrative in history, the shadow aspect of it really came in because this is what photographers do. They work with shadow and light. Um, all of that went into that. And I think, you know, Kiki, you're absolutely right in the sense that uh, I was looking also at doublings you know, he, the, the real person versus the image that they leave behind, the other parts of ourselves that seem to follow us no matter where we go, the, um, we all have those personalities, the more mm -hmm. intimate aspects of ourselves. And I wanted to use the shadow, the doubling as, as another way to approach those questions. Um, the shadow king is, uh, you know, in one sense, it's it's Minim who is who has an uncanny resemblance to the emperor. But you know, in another sense, when that when the emperor left, I imagined it was the women. It was Hirut who rose up 
in that in that land that was shadowed and became a king. They weren't replacing a queen. They were kings in their in their own right. So I wanted to um, represent that as well. It was really beautifully done. Thank you. Um, maybe going off that idea of what you were saying, these different parts of ourselves that follow us. Someone in our Facebook group, Karen asked, which I thought was an interesting question. Can you talk about how rage fuels the characters in the book and the impact of rage on their lives? And at first when I read this question, I was like, oh, that sounds so harsh. But then I was thinking back to a few moments in the book. I think there's this moment early on when Aster is going up to have sex for the first time with Kidane, is that? Mm -hmm. Kidana, Kidana, yeah. Kidana. Mm -hmm. um, and it says, um, you write, she's suspended above the celebratory voices, trapped by a curdling rage that she mistakes for fear. Mm -hmm. And then I love at the end of the book, there's that moment where you see, it, it says, when the, when, what can the camera see of her, talking about her root, mm -hmm. of her later mercy and that lifelong rage that she will finally release in the surrender of a father's mm -hmm. letter to her son. And I thought it was interesting that there's this moment in the beginning of these books, these, these two really central women characters, Aster and Haru, and you bookended it by talking about the, mm -hmm. the rage and the anger that they felt and how maybe that was, was mistaken or trapped in the ways that it came out. So I don't know, maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, that's interesting that um, rage feels like a really strong word. And I think part of it is we don't necessarily equate it with being female, being a woman. It's not the way that we're taught to move in the world as girls. We are often taught to be afraid. Don't, don't walk at night, you know, by yourself. Don't go on this street. I, you know, I, I feel when I'm talking to friends of mine who are men, their perception of where they can go, what street they can walk on at what time is so completely different from mine. And I realized that, you know, as I was raised to be careful, not to be angry, but that's different from being angry. We're, we're taught to be careful, to watch mm -hmm. out, meaning that we're taught to accommodate the world. We're, we're not taught that the world should accommodate us. And I wondered what, it, what, it would mean for someone like Aster or someone like Hirut to embrace their anger and to begin to say that to be angry is my right and to be enraged is something I deserve. Like that is an emotion that we need to embrace. Uh, how would the world change if we moved through the world that way? Um, and war becomes a, a, a way for them to to move through their spaces um, with that. But I, uh, you know, I think that even afterwards, they, they learned how to, how to walk through the world with that rage. But one of the things I also wanted to complicate is what happens to human beings who continue to carry that. Uh, forget, you know, just women, but men and women. Where does the anger go? Where does the rage go if we don't know how to maneuver through that? And uh, this is part of the reason I wanted to begin the book in 1974, you know, 40 years after the war, to think about what that does and what, what does Hiro need to do in order to let go of that? Um, and so I was exploring that with her in those chapters. That completely came across. And I think something that came across with every character was how much they everyone was such a product of their environments and and the the path they were born into but at the same time they were given so much free will and so much agency and i think that's what gives the, the book so much of its charge because mm -hmm. each character ha is walking this path and you're they come to these big moments when you're wondering which choice are they going to make i mean for me i think i i might have told you this before but after was a character that i initially really struggled with and i i disliked her a lot and as the book came <laughs> kept going you made it so hard for me to continue to dislike her and my heart just went went out for, out to her and i think there are a few scenes that that stand out to me there was the one with that say sorry one more time kadan kidane kidana Kidana, that initial scene that I talked about. And I think he's an interesting character because there are so many 
moments where you think, okay, he he made a choice that was was representing rage. Um, and but you also show how he really was this product of his environment. So there's mm -hmm. that moment when he's going to have sex with Aster for the first time. And I think the line is something like, we can see him tremble and we know that he will do what he has been, what has been done by those he has called his fathers. Mm -hmm. And then there's a later moment when he's talking about his classmate um, and his companions and kind of where he's end up and where they ended up. And he says, um, before he was pulled into the allegiances of war, he and his friends loved each other like brothers. They were men who understood him without explanation. Childhood companions who knew what it meant to be trapped by duties and expectations, and who shouldered all of it by moving deeper into their familiar circles, taking advantage of privilege because it all came at such a high, invisible cost. Mm -hmm. And you do this at the same time with Ettore, on the other hand, who's on the Italian side. He has this moment with his father, which I thought was really impactful, where his father says, um, something to the effect of most people are not born um, when they should be. And he goes, how I hope this time is meant for you. Atori understood even then that this was not an admission as much as it was an untelling. Mm -hmm. His father's way of moving around what he could not say about those who were unlucky and those who were not born when they should have been. And I thought this was just such a beautiful way of showing within each character how they were put in this really, really narrow path. I think about this with the cook, with the after, it goes on and on. There's that moment where the cook is being beaten and she says she knows that after's punishment is going to come in another way and, and following the narrow path that was set for her. And I, I, I don't know, I just, I don't know what my question is, but I just marvel at how did you create all all of these different characters who were felt so fully realized and so fully a part of the environment they grew up in. And then you gave them each these really hard decisions. Like, was there any character that came easier or harder to you? Were there any decisions where you like, I really don't know what, you know, Ed Tory would do in this situation? Or how, how did you think about that balance of privilege and punishment and, and all of that? It's so impressive. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for picking out those parts too. That um, those sections were moments I really, I really worked on. Um, you know, I we're all complicated as human beings. That's the one thing I had to make sure that I understood with my characters that even if they behaved one way in pu in public with each other, they were in essence covering up old wounds as they moved through the world. Um, we all have these wounds. We all, we all behave in ways that protect ourselves. And we are consciously aware of it, even if we never show that when we are in public. And I wanted my characters to have those kinds of complexities, especially when um, I was writing moments of, of cruelty because I think it's it's very easy to to think of cruelty as just this linear flat thing that has no history, no cause. Somebody's just born this way, uh, but I don't think that's that's the reality. At least you know, with my characters, I didn't want to be. I think in real life, there's some people that are really evil. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, <laughs> right. Uh, but with my characters, I was going to be a little bit. Uh, more more open with them and I wanted all of them even with the flaws that I understood they had to have it come from a place that was understandable uh comprehensible for me and so even the Colonel Fuccelli that for me was probably one of the hardest characters to write because he just he was so just cruel in many ways and enjoyed the cruelty but you know every I, I truly believe there's a line that every human being will not cross and as writers and as as a writer I had to figure out what that was with my characters so you know Fuccelli in a sense takes Ettore under his wings and protects him as best as he can, as much as he's doing these other things. Ettore has these moments where he um, he's grappling with, with his place 
in this in this war and and the types of things that he's forced to do um but he, there's a humanity there and i wanted to keep bringing that up and kidana was well wow, that was a hard one especially in moments with uh aster and and hirut uh you know even with hirut he thinks he's being gentle as he's not he doesn't think that there's anything wrong with this and i had to create a man who was really of his time and of his of his uh community because that's really what people like him thought that they had a right and the the girl would have no say in what was being done i think you do that so well also with the character's internal dialogue where you mm -hmm. really force the reader even in those moments when it's so uncomfortable but to see the world through those char that character's eyes rather than looking at it through your own perspective or through another character's perspective so i think that was difficult but also so rewarding as a reader thank you a stylistic question that came up julianne and melinda were wondering about your decision to use not use quotations for dialogue um and julianne pointed out something interesting that i didn't consider but she felt like it sometimes enhanced the chaos of a battle um and melinda felt like sometimes you maybe wanted the reader to be guessing was this internal was this mm -hmm. external thought but I don't know, is that just a style choice that you always make as a writer or? Yeah, no, my first book had had quotation marks. Um, I, you know, when I wrote this book, Kiki, I really had no sense that it would create this uproar, but it did. Um, I was writing it. Uh, how do I, I don't know. You know, there are a couple of reasons and, and they all came to the fore uh, 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 towards the end when I said, maybe I should try to add these quotation marks. And then I tried and it just didn't work. So um, a couple of things. One was that there's a momentum with, with the way people are speaking and, and the action. I wanted to eliminate that space between thought, action, speech as much as possible. Because I was thinking about the way that groups of people sit and, and tell stories to each other and nobody's pausing necessarily to say and then he said that and then i said da, da, da. we tell our stories and then da, 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 na, na. you know when we really get in the flow we start we just speak and people get it and so i wanted to convey that because part of it also for me is how do i create a book that is like a song that mm. is like a musical composition where the chorus is coming in, there's an interlude. There are refrains that go through the book the same way that it does in music. Um, I imagine this as an orchestral piece in some, some way. And when I, when I thought of it, it, it didn't leave room for those like very literary, literal pauses that tell you hear someone speaking. Um, hopefully with the cadence, uh, the rhythm could play some of, uh, some role in separating that. Um, people have told me that they eventually got used to it, but apparently it threw people off. Um, but thank you guys for sticking with it. I had no idea. <laughs> no, it honestly didn't bother me. I think like in recent years, I feel like I've read more and more fiction that yeah. doesn't use quotation marks. So I wonder if that's something more and more writers think about. I also think the the chorus sections in this, this book added to exactly what you were just talking about, that sense of this collective voice. Mm -hmm. Have you read The Prophets by Robert Jones Jr. that's coming out in January? I cannot wait to read it. I have okay. it. You have to read it. There were a few things that reminded me of it. It, it also has the chorus aspect and some interesting things. You, you'll have to read it, but with the mm -hmm. Shadow King, because he goes deep into history of some African nations and how, the roles that women played and how gender was not represented in what we wow. might consider a, a traditional way. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, I think you'll really like it. Oh, I can't wait. I'm really excited to read that. And then you mentioned your, your first book, Beneath the Lion's Gaze, which I have to read now because I'm such a fan. But someone <laughs> yesterday mentioned that there is some overlap with characters between that book and The Shadow King. Can you yeah. talk a little bit about that? And do you think any of these characters will have continued lives in other books or stories you might write? That's a good question. Um, yes, there is some overlap. And initially, I had put these in 
partly as a as a note to myself as a like a private little hey Maza you know how are you from the first book um, the last part of um, the Shadow King there's a section in there where a character appears um, so in that last part that part is actually the first chapter of Beneath the Lion's Gaze. Mm. So they kind of connect. I was doing it because I, I knew that I wanted some people to show up from Beneath the Lion's Gaze, show up 30 years earlier. Uh, and then I thought, this is actually, I want to try to work this out so that they, uh, they connect. Um, so I did it. I didn't expect anyone to really pick up on it. So I'm glad uh, that readers are doing that. And it was such a fun thing to do. And because I'm asking questions about what we carry forward into history, what we carry forward in our lives, what do we let go of? I have a feeling if possible, I might do something that connects the Shadow King, but I'm not quite sure yet. I just think it'd be fun to try. And I think it was so interesting how you bookended this story with the 1970s while you're saying, so we see this glimpse of how her route has changed. Um, and something that we talked about yesterday is when you first read the opening of this book, it almost seems like Ettore and her route are like long lost lovers. And it's a little bit from a Tory's perspective with these letters he's sending her. Mm -hmm. And I loved how in the ending, I don't know if this is your intention, but I just felt like a Tory's own stupidity and blindness came out so well, where it was like, of course, his feelings were not reciprocated by Haru. And he had, he had entirely missed the point. Like he had been seeing things through his lens and literally through his camera lens and he had missed this whole other world and this whole other person's reality and experience and I think mm -hmm. I, I loved the book so much but I think the ending in particular to me was so beautiful and something that I want to keep going back to and reading because I feel like each time I do I, I pick up on another another layer and I'm just curious did the ending come to you naturally did you always know that that's how it would end that mm -hmm. Harut would give the letter back or how did you kind of think about that? I had a sense, but I wasn't sure if she was going to give that letter back. I don't know if it wasn't until I wrote it. I didn't, I wasn't, I didn't know if she would or not, but in the process of writing it and writing her struggle with keeping it or not and looking at him, I suddenly understood with her that forgiveness is what frees her. And that letter is an act of forgiveness because she recognizes that the two of them understand each other on a level of loss, even though he was also the cause for some of this. Um, but they understand each other on that part. And she also knows that in doing this, she frees herself. Mm -hmm. uh, but it wasn't an immediate thing. What was immediate, and it was something that I just really my editor and I really disagreed on is that my editor from at the very beginning said, you know, Maza, could you just write a love story? Can they get together in the end? I was like, Jill, they are not. <laughs> no, <laughs> oh my gosh. I would have been so mad because there was part of me that wanted her to just like punch him in the face, not give him the letters and never speak to him again. Oh my gosh. I'm so glad you didn't do that. So it wasn't until maybe a month ago, maybe two months ago, we were, she and I had a, a conversation at a festival online. And it was the first time she said to me, I'm really glad you didn't follow my advice. I'm glad you fought me on this. <laughs> so it just, you know, there's this sense and we, you know, we get these stories, we've read these romance stories all the time of these men who come in and they treat women poorly. And, but the women interpret that as strength and then they fall in love, you know? And I said, this is just not going to happen. It's, you know, we, I, I don't, I don't want that kind of story. And unfortunately, you know, Italians truly believed that this is what Ethiopians would do, that they would just say, forget it. We're gonna, we're just gonna, we're love you, you know, because you are kind or sympathetic. And I did not want that, that story 
you know, continuing um, if the book went it went into Italy. So I wanted to break those things and to show a person who's complicated, but who's done some very horrible things to this woman. And this woman who says, I, I will forgive you, but not for you. It's, it's really for me. And, you know, you can go on your way. And I think the other thing that was so interesting about it, Tori, is you showed how he really had all of these weaknesses. And there were moments when, as a reader, I sympathized with that. And there were moments when I found that very grating. But he, like all of the other characters, he was put in this situation that maybe he didn't want to be in. Um, but he also didn't rise. He didn't necessarily rise to the occasion and 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 do what he could have done. He didn't do the least amount of harm possible. Mm -hmm. And I thought there was that beautiful moment at the end where there was a little bit of recognition of that. And it just makes you think as, as a person we're walking through the world, how, how much you impact another person and you might not even think about it and just to, yeah, it's to, you to know, be gentle with your connections. Absolutely. I think that's absolutely, you know, Ettore is, he's co-opted into uh, these actions, but at some point he starts, he feels very gratified in what he does. And I, I didn't want to let him off the hook with that. And you're right, we, if there's anything that this pandemic has shown us, in fact, is how connected we truly are. And, and we have to be gentle, exactly like you said, with these connections. Well, thank you so much for talking with me today. Before I let you go, is there anything that you've read recently or that you're reading that you want to recommend? Oh, oh my goodness. Um, actress, actress by Anne Enright is Ooh, um, I haven't read it. really, really, really good. And uh, there is, oh God, A Girl is a Body of Water by Jennifer McCombie from Uganda. That's just fabulous. So I started I really that and I love that cover. So yes. I need to keep reading. It's beautiful. Yes. Yeah, those two I would recommend. Well, thank you so much for being here today thank and you, for Kiki. participating all month. We really appreciate it. Thank and for you. everyone watching, um, Maza, I haven't told you, but our this is another book I think you'll like, but for January we're reading <gasps> a collection called What Kind of Woman? Have Ooh, you heard of it? No, but I will look for it. Okay, we'll have to get you a copy. I think you'll love oh, it. Oh, I would um, love that. It's such an adventure, even for people, I don't typically read poetry, but it just takes you on this journey of womanhood and questioning what oh, does it wow. mean to be a woman, a mother, a friend, a partner. So I, I think you'd like it. Oh, um, that's thank great. You so much. Thank yeah, you. And everyone um, can tune in to coop.com slash coop book club and, and Mazda will talk to you later. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.